G'day. I'm a Cairns girl. I actually grew up in um, Edge Hill when there were cane paddocks through most of Jensen Street and there were cassowaries in my backyard. And I spent a lot of time barefoot in cane paddocks and running around the bush. I'm a rainforest biologist now, so things haven't changed so much. Um, it's a pretty tough job. We're flat out most of the time. <laughs> and, but what I mainly do is I study how human land use affects rainforest animals. And what I'm particularly interested in is what are the characteristics of species that make them vulnerable to extinction. And so, really, for the last 25 years, I've been working in tropical forests around the world. And, just, and more recently, like many biologists, I've gotten involved in climate change, kind of by default, because the world's changing. Now, when you mention climate change, and I always feel kind of sick when I talk to non-scientists about climate change, because I feel like I'm about to really bore you. So I promise that I'll make this as painless as possible, OK? So, when oceans get hot, they get very, um, they get very, they generate rainfall, essentially. When oceans get hot, they get very active and they generate rainfall. Not unlike when you put a kettle on the stove. Around our planet, where the equator is, is where the sun hits the most, is where the oceans are hottest. And over the year, we get these hot oceans where the sun's mainly spending its time, and we get rainfall generated around that. And that's called the monsoonal trough. And not surprising, this is where rainforests occur around the planet. What global climate change models are projecting is that the Earth will get more hot spots in more different places. And that's essential, uh, very similar to what we see with El Nino. So El Nino here we see is this red expanse. It's demonstrating these hot oceans that are, that's moving from South America across the equator to the mid-Pacific. In an El Nino year, the mid-Pacific gets really hot, which means all the rainfall is in the mid-Pacific. In a very strong El Nino year, it pulls the rainfall from all the mainland areas into the mid-Pacific. We're very concerned about the future of tropical rainforests because most of us think of them as these warm, wet environments. We don't think of them as suffering droughts. But when we get these hot spots around our planet, like El Nino's, they pull the water, they pull rainfall to them, and they cause droughts. So not only are we worried about climate, about these big climate drivers and droughts. Most of my work's been done at a regional scale, and what I do is I study land, land clearing and land use and its effects on species. And what we've found is that in these clearings, they're hot and they're dry. And trees in the rainforest adjacent to those clearings, they, get, they use way more water than trees in the rainforest. And in fact, trees close to edges up to three kilometres into rainforest will use more water than what we find deep inside rainforests. So those clearings are creating like a, a local drought that's affecting rainforests. In 1997, I was living in the Amazon and there was a massive El Nino drought. And it was all over the world we saw drought in tropical areas. And in the north where I lived, there were a lot of farmers were lighting fires to clear lands. And during that drought, those small fires coalesced into really large fires, which burnt about 1.2 million hectares of rainforest, the largest fire that we've ever seen in that part of the world. 1.2 million hectares, that's about 3 million acres. It's about a sixth of the size of Tasmania. It's the size of Connecticut. And it's the size of the world, Her bigger, than, bigger than the World Heritage Area, which stretches from Townsville to Cairns. It's a lot of forest to lose in a single event. I'm very passionate about tropical rainforests because I think they're one of the most important real estate that we have on this planet. 
They are the most diverse real ecosystem. In less than 5% of land area, we see more than half of the world's terrestrial species. But what most people don't know is that they actually, beyond just being diverse, they play a really important role in stabilising and cycling elements through our atmosphere. They cycle rainfall. Not surprising, they're very wet. But most people don't know, they cycle about six times the amount of carbon that we emit every year by burning fossil fuels. So they play a really important role in stabilising our climate. In the wet tropics, where we live, we have a very small amount of tropical rainforest, but it's the most diverse ecosystem that we have in Australia. In less than 0.1% of our land area, we have 40% of all the bird species, including the southern cassowary, which stands almost as tall as me. And when you see them, when you have the experience of seeing them walking through the rainforest, you can imagine what their ancestors, the dinosaurs, would have looked 70 million years ago. Truly one of the coolest birds on the planet. We also have 35% of all the mammals in Australia, a third of all the frogs, you know, more than 60% of the butterflies and the ferns found in this small ecosystem that could be lost in a single fire event like was found in northern Amazon. This is the island of Borneo, which you can't see because it's swathed in smoke. Unfortunately, that's not cloud, it's smoke caused by fires. In the 1997-98 drought, more than 800,000 hectares of Borneo was burned. And it wasn't just that that was this, you know, two and a half million acres of forest, and, you know, that was a tragedy in itself. It actually, 90% of that fire occurred in a type of forest called a peat forest, which is like a swamp forest. And, you know, all the leaves and branches that fall out of the trees fall into this swamp, and it actually doesn't break down, or it breaks down really slowly. So with time, these forests build up an enormous material of dead plant material. You don't, that's not normally a problem because it's a swamp. But when you drain it and when you have droughts, they become very flammable. And that fire that burns so much land produced one and a half billion tonnes of carbon from a single event which is about a third of all the carbon humans produce each year from burning fossil fuels. Rainforests don't normally burn. So actually, if humans aren't in the landscape, it's not normally an issue associated with droughts. But what we do find is that trees die. And about 10 times more trees die in a drought than what die normally. OK, so what's the big deal? Trees die. Lots of trees die in a drought. We don't know very much about who's dying and why they're dying. But one thing we do know is it's the big trees that we know are dying. And these are the giants. These are the ancient trees of the rainforest. These trees are 500 years old, 1,000 years old. They've lived for a very long time, and they're dying at a faster rate than what smaller trees die in drought. They are, they're rare. These big trees, you might get one in a hundred, five in a hundred trees. So they're naturally rare in that ecosystem. But they're ecologically dominant. The, they supply the lion's share of fruits and flowers to the wildlife that live in that rainforest. They actually store more carbon than any other trees in the rainforest. So they are really important. If droughts become more frequent in the future, is what we think is going to happen, we are envisaging a forest where these giants can no longer survive. A forest which moves from enormous statured trees to a smaller forest that can cope with drought. And that's what I'm doing. That's, my plan is to understand how droughts affect tropical rainforests. I want to know Who's, die? Who's going to die? Why are they dying? Which forests in the world will be most susceptible to droughts in the future? 
But the first thing we have to deal with is this huge diversity problem. If we're going to answer this question, we need to deal with all those trees that occur in the forest. And so I'm going to ask you as an audience to participate in something with me. I want you to guess how many trees are in this photo. And I'll give you a clue. OK, I'll give you two clues. The first clue is it's about a hectare of forest. That's about 100 metres by 100 metres. The second clue I'll give you is normally in a hectare of forest, you get about 700 trees. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you a question. You can put up your hand if you think that's the right number. So who thinks there's 50 trees in that photo? No one. You, got, you understood the biodiversity bit. <laughs> who thinks there's 100 trees in that photo, right? How about 200? OK, and now I'm going to only finish at 300. So now you should probably all put your hands up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right. Wow, you're right. <laughs> it's closer to 300. In fact, I've worked north of this site, and there were the average tree, there was average diversity of trees was 280 species per hectare out of 650 stems. So it's an enormous diversity of trees. If you looked at all the forests in the world, we have about 45,000. Tree, spe tree species. So that's a lot. It's a lot to try to figure out who's going to live, who's going to die. What are the world's forests going to look like? There's, no, there's not enough of me, there's not enough biologists in the world to spend time figuring out and answering that question. So what we do is we need to work out characteristics of the winners and the losers. Characteristics of the species that we think are going to be drought resilient, and drought vulnerable. What I like to call the to Toyota Corollas of the world, you know, th these are going to be the guys that just keep going along, irrespective of all how badly you treat them, they'll survive, <laughs> versus the Ferraris of the world, which are really fast and do really well under the right conditions, but if you don't take care of them, I hear they break down a lot. So, then, so that's what we want to do. We want to get that 50,000 and we want to say, where are they going to fit? The second thing we want to do, unfortunately with our research to date and where droughts occur, we've been, they've been unpredictable. And we've never been necessarily in the right place at the right time knowing that a drought's going to come into place. So the way to deal with that is we need to simulate a drought. And what most people have done to date is they get a few pot plants, go in the greenhouse, don't water them, see who lives, see who dies. But for 35 metre tall trees, 50 metre tall trees, you can't do that. You know, what happens in a pot plant is not going to simulate what happens in the real world. So we need to create our own drought. And in the Dane tree, we've got this research station with the most amazing feature. We've got a 37 metre tall canopy crane which allows us to visit all these rainforest trees and the vines and the orchids and drop down into the forest, down as low as to the ground if we want. And we can visit all the plants and we can learn about what they're doing. So, over the last year, we've been describing everything that's happening in that, in that site where we're going to simulate this drought. We've been digging soil pits and putting people in them <laughs> to study how much water is in the soil and how far the roots go down. We've been collecting wood cores and looking at how much timber each species has versus how much vessels for moving water. We've got these cool little instruments that we can put on trees and work out just how much water a tree uses per day. And finally, we can sort of look at the leaves and just measure really fine details about how much trees breathe and how much they photosynthesize. And so by the end of this year, this is what we hope to achieve. We hope to achieve a football-sized field drought with plastic panels and guttering that's going to capture rain and take it off the site. Not all the rain, some rain will get through. We won't be able to stop everything. But what we want to do is we just want to see what will happen if we push these trees and drought them out and put them under pressure. Who's going to be the Toyota Corollas? Who will be the Ferraris? So, in conclusion, we live in, we live in changing times. 
I think if we can understand the future, what the future holds for tropical forests, it will be really important because it will give us an insight into what the future will hold for ourselves. Thank you.